Welcome to Academic Integrity, Urgent and Emerging Topics. This is our presentation for October 9th, and I'm delighted to be your convener for today. My name is Sarah Ellen Eaton, and I work as the uh, Educational Leader in Residence at the Taylor Institute for Teaching and Learning. Uh, we'd like to begin our session this morning by recognizing and appreciating the Indigenous territories on which the Taylor Institute for Teaching and Learning is situated. Specifically, we'd like to recognize that we're on Treaty 7 territory, which is uh, home to the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Bakani, and Gainai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation, comprising the Stony Nakoda, uh, Wesley uh, First Nations, Chiniki, and Bears Paw, and the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. A couple of uh, housekeeping notes before we get started today. Uh, your participant uh, mics will be muted throughout the session. We welcome your questions through the chat box. And also, uh, we recommend that we keep the cameras turned off and the session will be recorded. The recording will be uh, shared with other registrants of the webinar who couldn't be here with us today live, um, and, but your name will uh, not appear uh, uh, sorry, it says your name may appear actually in the participant list. Uh, and I also wanted to thank those of you who made the time to be here today. On uh, this Friday, uh, we're in Canada, we're just moving into our long Thanksgiving weekend. So I wanted to in real time uh, and also gratitude to Helen Pethrick, our webinar production coordinator, and of course, to our very special guest presenter, Dr. Cecilia Parnther. Uh, this is part of a large webinar series on urgent and emerging topics. I'll post the link for all of the webinar series uh, in the chat in just a moment, but wanted to let you know that our next webinar coming up will be on November 13th, and it will be presented by Kita Gladio at the University of Calgary, who will be talking about Indigenous paradigms in practice, relationships, story, and academic integrity. After that, we'll switch gears for the final webinar of our fall term, uh, and we'll look at contract cheating and crypt cryptocurrency with Dr. Joel Reardon from our computer science department. And with that, I'll stop sharing my, my screen and give our guest speaker a moment to get her slides set up. Uh, and I'd like to introduce her while she's doing that. So we are very lucky and privileged today to have with us Dr. Cecilia Parnther from St. John's University uh, in, uh, in New York. Cecilia, we can see your slides and you just put them into presentation mode. So I'm going to hand the mic over to you and let you take it away. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, it's such an honor to be here with all of you uh, for some of you uh, this morning, and uh, it's just at this afternoon um, here in, in New York City, but it's a real pleasure to get to have this conversation with all of you. Uh, thanks to Dr. Eaton um, and to Helen for all of her help in putting all of this together. Uh, my name is Cecilia Parnther, as was mentioned. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And tonight, today we'll be talking about enhancing equity um, in academic integrity. So I'm an assistant professor of higher education in the Department of Administrative and Instructional Leadership at St. John's University. Um, and so my focus is on higher ed. Um, I look at knowledge acquisition and student success. Before that, I was a former administrator for uh, many years in student conduct and academic integrity offices at several institutions. Um, so I have a lot of familiarity with, with honor codes and the things that many of our, our academic integrity administrators go through. Um, and as you continue on uh, navigating remote learning, face-to-face -face learning, and all of the heightened challenges that come with that, I truly am in awe and appreciation of all of the work that you do um, to maintain high academic standards at our institutions. I consider myself a researcher of academic integrity education. Um, specifically, I'm interested in looking at intersections of our policies and practices and how they relate uh, and serve our marginalized populations. So as Dr. Eaton mentioned, um, I would like to incorporate the chat feature. Um, I consider myself a collaborative uh, presenter. And so I do request that you place your questions and comments in the chat box throughout um, the webinar. And Dr. Eaton and I will pause at multiple times throughout so that I can make sure that we are in conversation. So if there's a, a piece 
throughout the, the slide presentation where you'd like more clarity, more information, um, more specifics on research, or you simply have a comment that you'd like to uh, engage the rest of, of the audience with, I'm happy to do that and, and engage. I think that's a real important part of the, the learning and, and collaborative process. It is very important to me that we address as many of your comments uh, and questions as possible. So I'd like you to, to view this as an open discussion. So the learning outcomes, as many of you saw um, in the registration, were to define our current challenges to equity and academic integrity, um, to recognize current practices and the ways that they are upholding unequal outcomes, and then just to review some of those best practices for um, practice and, and research in academic integrity. Briefly, I'd like to go over our current landscape for academic integrity. So we've seen cheating is prevalent in post-secondary uh, educational institutions and Although that last citation there is 2012, it's clear that uh, there have been many more recent citations that are showing our prevalence somewhere between 50 and 90 percent. Um, and so this is something that is happening on a large scale, is not limited to a specific group of people uh, or, or persons or experience. Um, we recognize that students are making this decision um, and they are willing to admit that they're doing so, uh, which is which is very interesting. But how we continue to define and redefine academic dishonesty is changing uh, for a number of reasons that we'll get into, namely technology, um, our incre increased globalization. And there's this idea that as we have uh, increased diversity, uh, a lot of our policies, our teaching and learning hasn't necessarily risen to the occasion of meeting students uh, where they are. We have a lot of consequences that are associated with academic dishonesty. We recognize that it can lead to workplace dishonesty, but most importantly, it really erodes the fabric and the relationship of trust that we should have with our institutions. For students who uh, consider themselves in a partnership as learners, uh, for teachers who consider themselves in collaboration uh, in developing research and also um, instilling uh, lessons and opportunities for learning uh, for their students and then institutions who are upholding certain standards you know education is a trust market um, and what i mean by that is that we are selling students something that while we put a price tag on it they can't actually link that price tag to the things that they are getting because we believe that education is transformative we believe that education might not have those immediate payoffs in that first entry level job but that the tools the capacity for learning um, and the willingness to grow that students receive from a higher education is something that will last with them for a lifetime. And so when we look at academic integrity, I want us to really think about this fabric. And when we erode that trust, then what we are saying is that we haven't held up our end of the bargain um, in terms of our reputation, that students don't need to take it seriously. And when we think about, when we think about that, there becomes this question of, well, where is this value? Where is this value if I can just find all of the information myself and choose to not engage and not have these conversations and participate in an academic experience uh, that doesn't really resonate with who I am and where I wish to go? So there are a couple of theoretical frameworks um, that guide my research. The first is based in social learning, and many of us in education are familiar with, with Bandura, and that's that we learn indirectly, actively, and inactively, right? And so why I use this as an example is because our students are going to learn what we value, what we don't care about, and who we hold to certain standards and who we don't. So there's all of this learning that's going on. Um, and of course, we recognize that student development and, and the body of work 
I say Kibler here because uh, Kibler uses student development in academic integrity. Uh, this relates to the values development, the moral development, the, the maturity of the student and understanding that they are still developing those things. Many of our students are. Um, and they're coming from a wide variety of viewpoints um, and a wide variety of traditions that have allowed them to have the value systems uh, that they do have. There's also this element of social control, uh, which is very important for us to consider. And when we're considering equity, um, we have to think about how we have made some of these pieces punitive, right? And so our institutions are deciding for students what we consider to be socially appropriate. And those socially appropriate behaviors pretty much allow students to decide with whom and where they align on a spectrum of behaviors. Uh, am I going to choose to align myself with individuals who share my value system? Am I going to question those things? Am I going to make changes? And what is the institution going to do in response to those behaviors? And then I also uh, lastly add on cultural dimensions. And cultural dimensions are really important here um, from this frame where we're thinking about how we benefit independently. So, you know, what it means to lean capitalist, uh, to focus on individual opportunity, uh, individual learning, and that sort of pursuit versus um, a collectivist mindset where it is my responsibility to help everyone um, to succeed. And those things end up showing us um, different perspectives on academic integrity. So we're, we're gonna look a little bit at the literature on trends and definitions. We've talked a bit about how often academic integrity or academic misconduct happens. Uh, we're going to talk about why academic misconduct happens. Um, we're going to look a little bit at historical underpinnings of academic misconduct because it's important in terms of, of equity, right? So when you're thinking about the historical underpinnings, what we're really talking about are students' uh, responses to being dissatisfied with their experience. And so because they were dissatisfied and disengaged, they chose to rebel. So when we first look at honor codes and the idea of, of punitive measures, we're really responding to rebellion. And so there's a piece of that when we think about equity in academic integrity, when you consider students who feel that they are a part of systems who may not have been meant for them, who might not uh, be responsive to them, and what those what those those characteristics do uh, to a person. And so rebellion doesn't just happen for marginalized communities by any means, but rebellion is a really important piece of academic integrity because we have to remember that students are responding to what they're feeling in addition to not knowing, in addition to all of the other factors um, that we get into. And then, of course, our literature tells us how academic integrity is normally handled on campus. And there is little to no uh, research in the space of, of how we manage that equity. Um, we do talk about certain populations and how we can better serve them. Uh, the bulk of that research, as many of you may know, is focused on how we serve international students, our students who may um, speak a different language than the the native language of the institutions that they come to. And so there's a lot of, of literature on that, but very little in terms of how we talk about overall equity in the process. But what we do know is that it's handled in a number of different ways. Depending on your institution, you'll have a faculty managed process where perhaps an academic integrity office is simply notified um, uh, and the infraction is reported. <clears throat> You'll have student-led systems uh, where students manage an honor code process um, and things go toward a board that way. And of course, more broadly, we have our, our punitive responses and we have our, our educational responses. So 
So just concluding those pieces, we know that this is very prevalent in post-secondary education, um, and we know that the consequences of academic dishonesty are significant to our reputation, to our value, um, to a student. I always like to say that students have this really precious opportunity here to try things out, to figure out how they want to grow and, and who they wish to develop into intellectually um, and, and in the workplace. And college is one of those places, whether they're a traditional student or non-traditional student, where they actually have this safer space to land when we create equitable pathways. Um, and so we really have this responsibility um, to promote academic honesty and to do so in a way that is salient to the individuals who are a part of our community. <clears throat> so a lot of the work that I do also uh, revolves around these six fundamental values of academic integrity as defined by the International Center for Academic Integrity. And those are a commitment even in the face of adversity to, to these big pieces. Of course, we expect honesty. Uh, we expect that students, that faculty are coming to this work um, to do it correctly, to properly cite, to uh, properly value intellectual tradition. But the question becomes, who's taught that expectation, right? We know what honesty means to us, um, but who is teaching these, these traditions? When we think about respect for the work of our, for our work and for the work of others, who is teaching what that means in context? Um, these are sometimes words that we take for granted, the idea of of what your individual responsibility is. Um, and Trisha Bertram Gallant talks a lot about institutionalizing uh, these concepts and these, these practices to really uh, help to create learning environments for students um, that promote integrity and prevent misconduct. And part of that learning comes in actually defining these in ways that are culturally relevant and in ways that don't um, have expectations of a student that you can't necessarily measure. Am I suggesting that no student understands what academic misconduct is? No, I am not. But we understand that students learn more um, and in very important ways when things are contextualized for them. In terms of what we consider fair, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about as, as we have dealt with the worldwide pandemic is how different groups of people have considered fairness and what they consider to be fair. And if we're having these different dynamics, when we're internally focused, we're focused on our families, we're dealing with crisis and trauma, then what are our students going through? How are they defining what is fair when they're getting an educational experience that is less than perhaps what they had expected? Um, what does it mean to, to have these characteristics? So that's something I'd like us to think about um, as we continue on. So what we do know is that academic dishonesty refers to this set of behaviors, um, and I won't read the, the definition there, but all of us have academic misconduct policies at our uh, universities and colleges, and they are all, um, they all have things that are rooted in our mission. They say very specific, uh, they say very specific things that basically speak to what our expectations are. The question becomes, how are we explaining these examples to students? In what context are we explaining these examples to our students? Um, and even here, you know, I've listed some of the more popular terms but I'm willing to bet that if I were to ask all of you to reflect on what's in your handbook, there are some variations on these. Uh, and when you look closely, you'll see that those variations even go into how the things are defined. Um, as part of my research, I do a bit of content analysis on student handbook language around academic misconduct. And some of 
the the language is just so different from from other institutions that it makes me wonder how we fully expect students to completely understand what is expected of them. So before we go on, um, I just want to check to, with Dr. Eaton to see if we have any questions or comments in the chat box. Uh, we did have a question come in from Teresa a little bit earlier. There's been a lot of chat, uh, and this might be something that you're going to address a little bit later on, but she's interested in knowing about academic integrity from the instructor side of the equation, and this has been considered or studied. So I'll let you respond to that, and if you're, letting, or if you're going to address it later in the presentation, then do let us know. So yes, thank you very much. Um, that's a great question. I do address a bit of it. Um, just to give you kind of a preview of, of what that's talking about is I'm going to get into this idea of citation politics um, and the role that it plays in academic integrity um, because we recognize that that for faculty, for researchers, there's this expectation of um, there's an expectation that folks are publishing, folks are adding to the literature in a very specific way. And if that way isn't followed, then you might not be cited as much. Um, and, and as a result, that might not be seen as, as prolific or as important to the research conversation. And so that definitely has a significant impact on what faculty choose to do, what they choose to teach, who they choose to include in their syllabus, um, and of course what that means for uh, their pro professional trajectory. Um, because as I always say, what you do on the road to tenure doesn't immediately stop <laughs> after you've earned it. And so if you're making difficult decisions um, based on some of those those politics that can often have have consequences. So it's a very it's a very good point and I'll make sure uh, to touch on that more later in the in the conversation. That's terrific. Thanks so much. That was the only question we've had right now. Great. Thank you. So in terms of, of academic mis misconduct, these are things that we know for all students, right? Um, but for some of our students, they impact a bit more than others, right? And so these are the byproducts of issues with, with time, um, whether students have multiple varied responsibilities, especially now, um, as everything just seems to be up in the air given the pandemic, there, there's childcare, there's caregiving, um, and how they're able to balance all of that. Uh, we know from the research that confidence plays a lot into this. And where equity comes in is the extent to which we are helping to boost, uh, to bolster, or to limit a student's academic confidence, right? Because we know that students are responsive um, based on whether or not they think that they are performing well or have the ability to perform well. Um, students are all together making really tough decisions about what classes they're taking, how it can be taken online if that's a requirement for them, how it can be taken in this new environment. And so as a result, um, a lot of things are coming in from all over. Right, so you have your peer influence. We have a tech industry that is coming up with more products and, and more tools to make these things difficult for students. Entire classes can be purchased, um, as you know, or assignments can be purchased. Um, folks are targeted with advertisements for things like um, <clears throat> things like uh, tutoring that then lead to other uh, dangerous options. But then we have some of, the, some of these, these bigger things. Um, how much respect do, do our students have for their faculty, for their fellow students, for their discipline? Um, in some of the research that I, that I do, I talk to an EMT faculty, and he discussed how in his work, they partner students partner up and they have this partner for the entire semester. And it's a really beautiful thing that as they're preparing for, you know, these state exams, that they have this expectation of who they are, their, their professional, their, their scholarly identity, um, and that it's expected that you are acting with integrity both in simulations and in study. I mean, it's a very, very important thing is building up that respect. 
And then of course we have, um, as I mentioned previously, that personal interpretation of academic misconduct. So how folks are, are handling academic misconduct. So we know that we have the punitive pieces, um, which you know, relate to our, our disciplinary procedures. We have education, uh, educational opportunities with tutorials, with modules, with, with various products, but also the education that happens in the classroom. And a lot of my research indicates that the education that happens in the classroom those are the things that are most meaningful to students because it's in context and it's a personal interaction. Um, with that, you know, those things have to be faculty driven. And then, of course, we have student driven policies, which are really important and rely on student engagement. Um, and some examples of those are, are below with the honor codes and councils. So what is equity in academic integrity? Equity in academic integrity is about making sure that everyone understands what is expected of them. That everyone understands what is expected of them, that they have the tools to be successful, um, and that there is no question in that. Um, equity and academic integrity is something that is focused on student learning. Um, if this is the biggest takeaway that I, that I can have, you know, it is difficult, especially for those of us who teach in really large lecture classrooms, in, in um, classes that require multiple test assessments. Uh, we need to be able to focus on these practices that allow students to demonstrate competency in authentic ways. And so one example that I give often is thinking about the K through 12 environment when we think about standardized tests. And we know that standardized tests have disproportionate outcomes for marginalized groups. And one of the big reasons for that is that historically, the tests were seen to exclude what we don't feel is normative. And so if we sit with that for a while and we think about what in our policies do we assume is normative? And how would a student struggle with some of those concepts? And it isn't okay to assume that they should just be able to figure it out. And, and the reason for that isn't because we shouldn't have standards, but it's because we've admitted these students. So we have admitted them and by admitting them, we're saying that we believe you have the capacity to succeed. And so then it's our responsibility to provide them with the tools that they, they can use to succeed. Does that mean that students will not commit academic misconduct and not do so purposefully? No. Does it mean that students won't lapse in judgment um, and do those things? Absolutely not. But when we center these practices around what all of our students need, as opposed to what we were created to center, then a shift happens that allows us to respond to the access that, that is actually keeping our institutions open, that is broadening our horizons and allowing us to, to refine and redevelop ourselves. Equity and academic integrity also refers to how we assess academic integrity. How are we doing that in ways that are culturally relevant? How are we doing that in ways that um, give respect to the varying needs of our students, right? Whether it's increasing access, whether it's understanding that students have multiple things going on, perhaps it's using multiple measures, perhaps it's recognizing that all students don't learn in the same way, and so how can we capture what we need for content mastery um, in a way that is still authentic for a student. And then of course we have enforcement, right? But equity and academic integrity relies on the fact that we are using tools that are going to disproportionately impact a group of our students that aren't going to cause additional anxiety and stress because someone is um, someone is not neurotypical, for example, um, because someone has varying responsibilities and can't 
maintain perfect eye contact uh, with the webcam? How are we making sure that the things that our institutions are investing in, um, that our faculty are using as investment tools, uh, as uh, assessment tools, I'm sorry, and that our institutions are investing in for multiple year-long contracts, how do we make sure that those aren't things that disproportionately impact our students? And I'd go farther to say, are we asking those questions? What in our data is letting us know how students are being referred to academic integrity um, councils, how they're it, finding themselves having these difficult conversations. What, what's the metric and how are we assessing that deeply? So for those of you, um, you know, who, who are hoping to dig into this more, which I, I hope is, is most of you, um, I'm wondering in the, in the chat if there are other things that, that you think of when you think of equity and academic integrity. And I'll just take a minute for you to consider that. Do we have anything that we'd like to add to this? Well, I, I had a question uh, and I haven't seen much in the chat, but I'll invite people to add their thoughts to what I put in the chat, which was, I'm wondering if you've seen much um, of the research around um, academic integrity and learning disabilities, because I haven't seen too much around that, but I've often wondered mm -hmm. if students with learning disabilities are somehow further disadvantaged by the systems that exist within our institutions. So I'm familiar with at least two articles that specifically are talking about um, what's considered neurotypical behaviors as it relates to to proctoring um, that I'm going to talk about in, in a little in a little while. But basically, um, we've made some decisions or these algorithms make decisions on what's considered normative and everything else is suspect, right? And so of course it disproportionately impacts um, students. The other article um, that, that I would talk about is more from a faculty perspective and it talks about how some faculty struggle with the idea of accommodations in general. And so as a result, they misinterpret a student's need for accommodations as somehow trying to circumvent the system. And so it creates this, um, it creates additional bias for a student who already, you know, may be anxious and going to advocate for themselves. And it kind of creates this um, distrust before the learning actually happens. And so those are things that I'm seeing. Um, we definitely need more in that space in terms of that research. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for that. We've had some great comments come in around. Um, uh, uh, Tatiana is asking specifically if you could say a little bit more about assessment of academic integrity that's culturally relevant. I think you probably have some great insights on that. Absolutely. So something that I really want us to think about is when we have expectations around group projects, for example. Right. When we have when we have group projects, perhaps you are allowed in your group to meet together and you're coming together to come up with this this synopsis of, of whatever you're looking at. But then you're expected to write findings alone. Um, we don't. So so that's one practical example where we have not discussed the limits of what a group project is. And for some groups of students, a group project is like, we were doing this together, we're submitting it together. And in some classes, it means that, in some classes, it means other things. Um, 
But more individually, when I think about things that are cultural relevant, I want us to consider the ways that we need to be mindful of references in classroom settings. So for example, what jargon are we using that we expect students to become familiar with? Um, again, an example goes back to standardized testing. When we use things like, um, an Irish limerick that we believe that most students will have had experience with, who are we excluding? Um, how can we create assessments that require originality, um, but also affirm a student's cultural identity? And so there's various ways of knowing and we can demonstrate competencies, you know, using our our language, using our experience um, in just really, really creative ways. And so it's all about getting out of that box where we have this, this very specific set of expectations for every student, right? And perhaps offering multiple measures of assessment um, to make sure that, that students are learning what they're learning. And then when we're talking about violations of academic integrity, or we're talking about um, just misconduct in general, how are, how, are we, how are we looking at that? Are we looking at demographic information, for example? And if we see patterns in our demographic information, how are we responding to that? Are we incorporating um, you know, diversity and equity, implicit bias conversations, if we're seeing certain things within certain disciplines, within certain groups of people? Um, we also recognize this idea of a spotlight effect. So if we make generalizations, and everyone has had this on their campus, where they believe that student athletes or international students or whichever students you want to pick, um, have trouble with academic integrity. These are things that, that we've heard on our campuses and that folks, we hear them because they're very comfortable saying them, right? And so where are we as academic integrity offices, as faculty, as administrators managing this process, having these checks to say, instead of, oh, we need to create a training for this population because, you know, they're more likely to cheat, <laughs> is to have conversations as to why we're seeing their violations more than others. And what is it about the things that we're doing to assess that allows these students to be selected more than others? Because the research is clear. Um, race in particular, uh, politics, religion are not indicators of whether someone is going to be uh, more academically honest or not. I'm nodding my head. Yes, yes, yes. We've got a lot of comments here in, in the chat. The chat's kind of just exploded. Um, have, have had some questions come in for you. Can, can we ask a couple questions now? Yes, please. Um, questions come in from Andrea around how does student safety manifest in equity and academic integrity? And in what ways do safety and equity and academic integrity interact and impact each other? Oh, that's so huge. And so I'm, I don't want to get repetitive for pieces that, that I do have coming, but the biggest thing for me um, is that institutions have an obligation to pr protect our students. And what's happening now is a real threat to that protection, to be honest. So, so there are several things that happen. The first I'll talk about is just that um, implicit bias, the microaggression, the stereotyping, so that a student can walk into a space or have a conversation and feel that if they do well, that they won't be believed that they are excelling academically. And if they do poorly, that they have done what was expected of them. And that's a really horrible place to be in. And we do know that anxiety plays into some of that decision making that we were talking about earlier. Um, another huge piece is the e proctoring, the surveillance systems. Um, I, I'll get into it a little bit more, but when you go into when you go into a testing site and you're automatically not seen. So let's sit with that for a second. Like you're not seen because of the color of your skin or because you don't have enough lights in your room when you're showing the, the 360 of the room that you're in. 
Um, if you don't have that quiet space that, that everyone is required to have because you're caring for someone or you have other responsibilities or you just live in an area where noise exists, you know, if you're unable to focus on the light where the webcam is and we are making it a requirement for you to be successful, those students are now unsafe. And not only that, but we've let private companies into their homes and spaces. And then that's something that's, that's really important. When we think about, um, when we think about online learning, so absolutely, we need to do what we need to do. And there are great, great tools that you can use for online learning. But it's really important to remember that students are now letting you into the space where before they had the safety of coming to a classroom, right? And so not everyone has that luxury. And I know that some students are back and some students are not. Um, but we have to remember that they're letting us into their private spaces and, and that implicit bias comes up again because there are all sorts of judgments. Not everyone has the blur feature or the, the virtual background. And even if they do, they, may not, they might not have the bandwidth uh, to make it work. And so the things that we say we're doing to be equitable um, because we're bringing in a third party to judge that when that third party doesn't consider your personhood normative, um, you are, you're harming, you're harming students. We're not keeping them safe in that way. I just, I just got chills. My brain's exploding. I'm expecting other participants are having uh, similar reactions, but we'll take it back to equity since that's what your slide is here. Um, mm -hmm. And we had a, a question, a comment came in from Jennifer that I think might, you might want to unpack a little bit because she commented that, you know, she has colleagues or other educators who believe that if students are seeking accommodation, they're just looking for an edge. Uh, and might not be being truthful about their test anxiety or disability. Um, and I think there's a real equity question there. I wondered if you might have uh, some thoughts to share. So um, I, it's a very, very good question, Jessica, that I, that I would like to unpack. So some years ago, um, and you may remember this, Sarah, um, we had all these conversations on whether or not students were using performance enhancing drugs like for ADHD and things of that nature if you're using them not prescribed like is this academic misconduct like how would that be measured and, and things of that nature so there is this there is a perception uh, from certain faculty that students are getting accommodations or their help seeking to try and game the system um, I think that my concern is that the concern about gaming the system is overriding the concern about students who need accommodations. Um, because for most students who are in need of accommodations, this is a very difficult thing to do. And so perhaps uh, you can provide me with some, some more Canadian context, but in the US, uh, students have what's called an IEP, an Individualized Education Plan from K through 12, and that ends in the 12th grade. And so when you come to higher ed, you are responsible for demonstrating that you've had the test taken, taking new tests, presenting yourself to an office, being registered, perhaps hand delivering these accommodation letters. So yes, are there students who could absolutely game that system? Yes, but I think that it's more important that we recognize that there's something that had that student go through all of the steps that it takes to require these accommodations. And perhaps if we were more concerned about those pieces, um, then students wouldn't feel that they had that they had to do that. We are always going to have students who cheat in various ways and trying to get additional accommodations could be one of those. But really, we don't do enough to serve the students who are in need of, of the accommodations and the act of requiring the steps that we do to make sure that they're advocated for um, makes it hard for me to, to kind of center that smaller group of students who might be trying to game the system. 
Terrific. We've had some other questions come in, but I'm also excited to hear your presentation. So maybe um, I'll gather up the questions and then I'll ask some more a little bit later on because I think Perfect. everyone's eager to hear uh, the other slides that you have coming up. Sounds great. Thank you. All right. And then, of course, practice that's informed by institutional culture and context. So for me, academic integrity um, requires, as I said, that we are linking to our mission and, and culture, right? But as our institutions have changed and have grown to be more accessible, to be more diverse, even some of our mission language may have changed to include those things. But how are we changing our practices and making sure that they're informed by our culture? So you always have those offices that are really innovative and they're doing all these great things. And when you get grant funding and you're celebrated in that way, it's great. But if you aren't, you're fighting against a culture or a set of, of traditions and contexts that are always going to beat up against that innovative practice. And so when I think about academic integrity um, and equity in this context, I'm asking, we could be saying all the right things and saying that we're supporting students, but if we know that there is an entire academic department that believes that international students will commit academic misconduct and they're behaving in a way that makes that an adverse environment for students. Our practice isn't, isn't matching who our institution is, unfortunately. And so we have to, you have to meet folks where they are and then build up, right? Because otherwise we're giving these multiple measures. Um, I'm sorry, we're, we're, giving, um, we're giving unclear perspectives to students. And it's really important that students recognize these are the things that I need to feel safe. Here's what I can do to advocate for myself. Here's where I see bias. Here's where I do not. I need to be able to be the best learner that I can. How, how are those things a part of the fabric of our culture? And if they aren't, we're the folks who need to be asking those questions because it is a part of, of our academic integrity on campus. So this is from the annotated bibliography um, because I wanted to make sure that we had some uh, Canadian context here. Um, and as I've said before, students are self-reporting that they have committed academically dishonest behavior. So this is not a question of, well, maybe we're seeing a disproportionality in reporting because that's just what happens, no. We're seeing no major differences in race. We're not seeing them among the years of study in this context. Um, students just don't think that it's a big deal. And a lot of times they might not think that it's a big deal because we haven't instilled that importance. But more than us not instilling the importance, we haven't made our work as an institution, not, not individually, but we haven't made our work relevant enough for them to realize the importance of honesty in many cases. And beyond that, students are reporting confusion. So no matter what you say is in your policy or how well you felt like you went over it, if they're saying that they're confused, and I know how much frustration, like I get the frustration because I have gone line by line and we've all been there, but if they're reporting the confusion, you know, we have this obligation to manage it in a way that meets them where they are. And so here are some things that I'd like you to just consider about your own programs, right? How do students know, students on your campus and all students, right? So, so think about your, your most vulnerable pop vulnerable <clears throat> i'll get there vulnerable populations on campus how do they know what academic integrity is um how are your instructors reinforcing how are we in providing these supports for instructors if you have a, a large amount or any amount really of of part-time faculty on your campus how are they incentivized to make sure that they're teaching these concepts in diverse ways because we know that they're not making enough to add that as you know another part of the work right how are we 
making it so they have the tools that they need? How are we making it so that students across the board have the tools that they need to learn academic integrity? And how are we celebrating it? How are we reinforcing these things as important in multiple contexts, using multiple measures, and using, you know, that originality that I'm talking about, the affirmation of identity that's showing student scholarship, that's showing diverse faculty scholarship, because ultimately that's what this is about, right? Is the idea that academic integrity is important because our ideas are important. And all of these ideas are coming from somewhere, right? But our identities are what are what are different. And so our ways of knowing are the things that help to contribute and make research so rich. And so if we aren't able to help students learn how to understand basic concepts and then stretch to be authentic, we're doing a disservice and they stop being engaged because in some ways they don't have those possibility models, right? Because they haven't seen someone do things their own way, but still have the language that they need to be successful in certain contexts. So going back to some of that annotated bibliography, like here are the things that we're, we're, we're not seeing, the questions that I'm asking, right? Because there are inconsistencies between what faculty understand and what they're implementing. Our policies change, faculty get that syllabus language, little cut and paste here. We might talk about it on the first day, are we having those conversations? And then beyond that, um, research indicates that, that faculty see this as a really laborious process, like nobody wants to have conflict, right? So you don't even want to have the conversation that someone might not be completing their work. Um, in an original and an authentic way. And so what happens, we really start to rely on that idea that somebody else can help us with it, right? And so if we use a test bank, for example, and even if we have like multiple multiple versions of the test bank, then we couldn't be inequitable, right? Because we got this from Pearson or whatever textbook manufacturer you might have. Like we, we got it from somebody whose job it was to do this. So I don't have to look through these questions because someone was able to take care of that for me. Um, I don't have to make sure that a student hasn't cheated because I have a proctoring system who can let me know. I don't have to have that feeling in my gut and and investigate to know what was incorrect or or correct or not cited about a piece of writing because a plagiarism detection software can tell me with a certain percentage of how original this work was so we don't have to understand the policies because we are reliant on so many of these tools. But we know that students, they don't want to be considered dishonest. They don't want to be considered a cheater, but they also lack an understanding of what that means from the institution. <clears throat> and then beyond that, there are just some faculty and students who really just don't want to deal with it. And the reason why some of this is so important right now is because we are all just in this moment experiencing educational trauma, right? And, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I'm so appreciative that, that so many of you are spending a piece of your Friday to engage in these conversations because I know what you're up against. Um, I know that everyone's caseloads, course loads, the things that you're navigating are just so intense right now. And to make time to invest in this and to engage in this conversation, um, that gives me a lot of hope. And it lets me know that so many of you have views that, that tell us that we can do better, you know, that we can be more equitable and give more to our students, but also um, just as scholars. Right, we can engage in more equitable practices uh, that allow students to have additional possibility models. So 
So how are ways that, that equity can be measured? Well, I'm gonna share how they're being measured right now in, in, in my own research. So I do a lot of vacuum analysis, right? I, I wanna know what types of programming are available. Um, I wanna see how messages are sent out. I like to see flow charts, who does orientation for new faculty? Um, who has information on academic integrity and their teaching and learning websites? Uh, what opportunities are there for engagement and how are those things advertised? And it goes beyond document analysis. I should have written content analysis there um, because I want to understand the landscape because as much as we feel that we're doing things in equitable ways and, and showing different audiences what they need at different times, um, sometimes it's just us because we really agree with it, right? So I think my PowerPoint is awesome because I spent so much time on it. Um, but is it something that resonates with you? Like we constantly have to think about how we are sending out this information and how it's being received. Um, and take that information with gratitude and figure out how to adapt and increase and engage because that's what engagement is looking at violation data and looking at it demographically, looking at it by, uh, you know, discipline, by prof. So everybody who's been in the academic integrity world has these conversations. Oh yeah, we got another violation from this person because they're the ones who always report. But then you've got 80% of your faculty you, you may have never heard from. So the question becomes, what's happening in their classes because we know that the the misconduct is happening so how is it being addressed how are students being affirmed how are students trying again if we don't if we're not having those conversations and for some of those students it just means that they've accepted the zero and everybody wanted it to go away but that also means that we don't know how the student's been affirmed. We don't know if the student understands what they did was wrong. I mean, I think they know what they did was wrong. Let me, let me rephrase. That they just feel that they just got caught or they know what the severity of that is and, and how they've impacted their learning. You know, we don't know that information. Um, the academic integrity survey, um, you know, that has gone out, I think is a really important tool and we should continue to look at students in particular who self-report, um, also faculty and, and how they're seeing these things show up because this is the thing, you're seeing this huge disconnect. Are we asking about demographic data there? Are we afraid to? Um, if we aren't asking, why are we not asking? What is it that we don't wanna know, right? Um, and of course, interviews and focus groups, we need to hear the words from the folks who are engaged in this process, right? Because if a faculty member has a different experience with academic integrity, then they bring that experience to the classroom. Uh, we always say things um, like, you teach the way you were taught. And so if someone was taught about academic integrity, they were taught to uh, affirm diverse perspectives and to expect that they would have to explain things in multiple ways uh, for authenticity and understanding, then they will do that. And if they never had to, because perhaps they were viewed as normative and they were in a classroom that didn't require that type of representation, then they may not have that perspective. So ultimately, upholding these values requires us to have equity. Um, we have to be student-centered in these, in these practices. Um, but our institutions have to make it a priority that our students are centered to Jessica's comment earlier, um, that we recognize what our students need and that we're able to provide them. Then we can get into conversations about, about fairness with what's provided when we are accommodating our students, when we're recognizing that differences come in ways that are not always federally mandated, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't absolve us of responsibility in that way. 
and that this is not a single process. It's going to require continued refinement and questioning why we're doing what we're doing. Um, it's going to ruffle feathers. It's going to take more work. But what it will provide students and, and faculty and staff is just a community that really cares about being its best. And it makes the normative behavior being trying to figure out what all of this means, what all the learning means in a really personal and individual way. Um, I think most of us are here because at one point in time, someone really just poured into us in terms of academic success. They really believed in us. They gave us an idea that, that we could contribute something important, valuable. Um, we felt like we needed to prove that in some way. And our students all deserve that as well. So before I move to our threats, um, I did want to see if if we can take a couple of questions. Yeah, you bet. yeah, I wanted to circle back to a question um, asked by Wendy earlier on about, um, you know, she's she comments that many faculty seem to base their understanding on assumptions about students. So how can faculty be encouraged to open their thinking and explore data rather than use anecdotal examples, seems this may relate to instructors building courage in themselves and a willingness to self-examine what practices they've chosen that may have disproportionate impact. Oh, Wendy, I don't think I can really say it. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't say it better than, than you did. You really did say it beautifully. Um, it requires courage and it requires this examination. We, we do suffer from this idea that even though we say that we're getting away from lectures and the whole sage on the stage thing, like we have a really hard time interrogating practices that we've done for years. Because a lot of the practices come with the best of intentions, but also some really bad things come with that. The bias comes with that. The, the stereotyping, the lowered expectations come with that. And so, um, you know, subconsciously, these are things that are are supposed to be able to protect us, but then they end up harming students when we associate those behaviors to the students. And so I think that, that there's a couple of things that really stick out to me from your comment. It, it is absolutely that courage and their individual desire to assess their behaviors, but I also think that the institution has a responsibility to create some imperatives around equitable actions and put it in policies and you know if we need to we incentivize certain things when we talk about service right we incentivize certain things when we talk about research how are we incentivizing the fact that we need our faculty to respond to the changing needs of our of their populations that we need our, our students to not be harmed because the ways of doing business that, that were okay for so long are no longer okay. Yeah, thank you. And that, that idea of bias and harm comes through in Sean's question, because he was wondering if you could comment a little bit more on how implicit or even explicit bias towards different groups of students impacts the application of academic integrity, like sanctioning or punitive measures uh, it, when there's been a violation. Absolutely. So I'm going, I'm about to get into, into a lot of that, but, but just uh, to really honor the question, the biggest thing is that the implicit bias shows up throughout. So it shows up before a student has committed a violation of, of the academic integrity policy. It shows up in how the professor might interact with the student, how their peers might interact with them, uh, whatever expectations are bestowed on that student, there's, there's this idea where you decide, I feel confident in this space or I don't. Um, I belong because of whatever characteristics I have or, or I don't. My, my heart goes out to a lot of students, especially the ones doing remote learning, who didn't have to share certain parts of their lives with their classmates. And now because they have to be on camera, for example, they're showing where they live. They, they might be showing family members who may or may not be supportive or may or may not appear to be what, what folks are normalizing as successful. 
And so as a result, those students are already dealing with a lot of anxiety and integrity, um, anxiety concerns. And so what the professor does in that moment is they're either going to choose to keep students safe, they're going to choose to affirm them and help them with that confidence, or they're going to ignore it. And students respond in kind. Um, so part of that is stereotype threat, and, and part of it is just getting to the bias. Well, if you're not going to expect anything from me, then why am I going to waste my time engaging when I know it feels is going to feel uncomfortable anyway, right? Um, you don't think I belong here, so I don't have time to try and prove you <laughs> to try and prove you wrong, or your class isn't that interesting. Um, and you don't value my contributions. So I'm gonna go see where I can Google this answer and, and get off of the computer. So those things absolutely show up. And, you know, it isn't, we have to train and let folks know about implicit and explicit bias. Explicit bias is easy, right? You see it, it's, it's clear, but it's that implicit bias for me that really takes us a step further because it's knee jerk. It's a knee jerk reaction. Sometimes you don't even realize that you've you've done it. Um, I always use the example that that's always in the media. You know, when someone clutches their purse when they feel unsafe, or um, when you close your eyes and you think about what's considered successful, someone who's considered successful. And no matter what we say, we all have those biases. And so when someone's personhood doesn't meet that need. Um, they always know and they recognize that and they respond in kind and unfortunately sometimes uh, that leads to that can aid in the decision to you know commit academic misconduct and then beyond that portion um, of the limited research that, that is out there we understand that students who are found responsible for academic misconduct, um, who are uh, minoritized, who are underrepresented, generally uh, receive sanctions that are more severe, um, are found responsible more often. Um, and you know, I've told students myself in practice, they are more visible. And so that visibility actually serves as a harm. And so you've had the bias all the way through. This uh, yeah, very powerful what you're saying. We've had a few more questions come in, and I've, I've noted that you said some you still got more content. So I think mm -hmm. we'll let you carry on with your slides, and I'll just save sure. some of the questions uh, for the next time. Perfect. Thank you. So I just want to give you some examples of, of those folks in the research who are most vulnerable to uh, academic misconduct violations, and so. Um, students who are academically underprepared, and this comes back to that, that confidence, um, are international students, and, and that's something that folks are well aware of. Disengagement um, is something that is studied, but it's becoming more and more apparent as more students had to go online. Um, and then here, uh, students who just lack time. Our students are not the traditional students that many of us came into education working with. And even if they are, many of them have multiple responsibilities. Uh, they are concerned about the cost of education. And so they're taking on additional jobs. They have familial responsibilities. Um, time is at a premium. And beyond that, when tuition increases at a rate that doesn't match the economy, uh, then folks want to get done as soon as possible. So there's also this added sense of urgency. In addition, our students who are marginalized and not uh, well represented on campus, um, students whose culture overall differs from institutional expectations, and that is different than being an international student. Um, and particularly around academic integrity. What I mean about that specifically is that some folks do not necessarily believe that sharing information, that sharing answers is a bad thing. Like they don't believe that in, in their heart and it isn't trying to um, be contrary or not having a recognition. Some folks are not brought up that way. Um, students who may have experienced educational trauma, the result of 
implicit bias, explicit bias, the results of micro and macro aggression. Some students come into our classrooms just really broken down from experiences that they've had in K-12, in college. Some of them have left institutions because of that and have sought out new institutions. Um, some of our students are experiencing educational trauma because of the disruption that happened with the pandemic. Um, students who have faculty who have experienced that trauma and are now dealing with disengagement. You have folks who are not invested. Um, and it's worth noting that at many institutions, what's valued most aren't those things that relate to academic misconduct for students. It, it's research. Um, and if a faculty member is focused on their research productivity, on other things that are unrelated to teaching, um, then there are consequences sometimes for students. And also the students who lack the social capital uh, to navigate policy and procedure on our campus. And that's, that's many students. Because while I'd love to believe that students read our uh, handbooks from cover to cover, we recognize that that is not the case. And so as a result, um, Folks who can navigate that know who to call. They're the same students you find who are able to find the, the small scholarships, the course extensions. There are a lot of students who lack that ability. So they lack that help seeking. So again, going back to the idea of, you know, seeking accommodations for nefarious purposes. We have so many students who don't even know how to navigate the system and they are in need of accommodations. Um, it's very hard to to focus on those who abuse the system because we recognize that there are so many out there who are just needlessly suffering. So why are our, our populations committing academic misconduct? They're responding to the fact that they don't feel represented, included, that they don't feel that their um, personhood is honored and valued. Some of them don't understand how important academic integrity is. They don't understand the components of an assignment and what they need to do. They don't understand how to manage their time to make sure that they, they get it all done. And, and cheating as coping is because students invest time and money to come into institutions and if they don't feel like they're being successful, they're figuring out the best way that they can to dot the I's and cross the T's. And so as long as they feel that they're continuing on, it serves a coping as a coping mechanism. This is what we're up against. We continue to diversify and we don't provide students with resources that matches that diversity. Um, we also have a customer service model in a lot of institutions that, that lacks nuance. And so just like with anything else, we I talked about a bit about how our policies have to match our missions and things of that nature. Well, our service model has to match that. And if we're not recognizing students for their unique needs and we have these buckets, and we all have these buckets, we have our our students who might be our traditional student, we have students who we consider um, in danger of not meeting some sort of a standard. And so they're responded to in certain ways. And that comes back to academic misconduct as well. We automatically go into this mode that doesn't take into consideration the issues, uh, the circumstances of a student's misconduct, and everything is is the same and on its face we're thinking well it can't be inequitable because everyone was treated the same well there was a a twitter post i'm, I'm citing a twitter post here where someone showed their lap and this was for a syllabus quiz and they had to show like where they were and the computer screen couldn't pick up um couldn't pick up their their skin tone so she failed the exam and it was a syllabus quiz, a syllabus quiz. And the faculty member said, well, if it failed, then there was a reason why it failed. And the student received a failing score for that. That's not, that's one of those responses that you get when your cell phone doesn't work and the warranty has expired. But even then we can still advocate for ourselves, right? But these students aren't feeling that. 
Um, the cheating industry is targeting vulnerable populations um, and is doing so really quickly. And, and they've got a model where they'll make sure that they're responsive because they have enough people who are participating and complicit um, to move that on. They're targeting students who can help to um, market to your campuses. They're targeting uh, students who are having trouble in your classes, and they're targeting students who just don't want to participate in your classes. Um, and we talked about some of the other pieces um, in earlier slides. One of the biggest issues, though, is that implicit bias. And implicit bias is because we've just had this exposure to stereotypes. And this isn't something that just happens because, oh, it was a lapse of judgment. These are unconscious active behaviors that happen. If I notice something and I feel uncomfortable, I jump, I shift. And it might not even be something that I recognize. And that's the, that's the most important piece, is that students are experiencing the act of bias before the person, before the actor, has ever, has had a chance to wrap their head around what just happened. And so you can believe that you are inclusive and you can have the best of intentions. But these are unconscious beliefs that are based on those stereotypes that were fed. Um, socially, we're fed them through the media. Academically, we're fed them in our, you know, in our office hours, in those minutes where you are talking to other faculty, when you're having a faculty meeting, when you are listening to folks, you know, as you're getting coffee, you're hearing these things and they're being stored away. And no matter what we do, they come up. Um, and they tend to favor, you know, our in-group. Why? Because it's self-preservation. Like if we don't think, <laughs> if we don't think that we um, are as good as we can be, that no one else would, right? And so we all hold these things. Um, and it's it's just a tool that that helps us to make quick judgments. Um, and we're more often to show this implicit bias um, when we find ourselves in non-diverse environments because we don't have uh, because in those in those situations you don't have the range right you don't have the uh you don't have the benefit of of engaging in these behaviors if you're constantly in actively choosing to engage in diverse environments right because you are forced your mind is forced to think about individuals in different ways and so to that question um if we want to come back to that um, and I can explain more. I'm happy. I'm happy to do so as well. Um, but I do want to give you an example. So the University of Virginia showed that from 1987 to 2014 that minority students faced a disproportionate amount of charges. So specifically, um, Asian students, Asian including international students, represented 50% of their academic misconduct cases. Um, and uh, African-American students at the university made up 41%. Um, and that was 41% before, to be fair, before uh, the 2010 school year. And then it went to approximately 19%. Uh, They're about 6% of the population. Um, and the Asian students uh, were a just over 11% of the population. Um, and I'm gonna put together a packet so you can see some of that information. And so what happened was um, there was gonna be some litigation. And so everyone got together to pull out this big report that includes, and, and here's the important thing, it includes student and faculty reports. So they have a student, you know, a student-led honor code. So you've got students who report are reporting on other students and uh, faculty who are reporting as well, right? And so these are some of those sanctions just to give you a visual of what that was looking like. And then that other was largely um, international students as well. It's important to note. 
and that was to 2016, sorry about that. But when you think about that, and, and it is dated, but I want you to think about that time period. That is a system of graduating classes that responded in that way. So you think about implicit bias, and you think about the fact that students are being socialized by their peers, by other faculty, that certain people, these are the people who are found responsible for academic misconduct. And not only that, but of those people, the students are being more likely to be sanctioned and more likely to be removed from the institution. In terms of legal ramifications, another really important thing to think about as we're, we're thinking about these things, because the immediate reaction is stereotyping is horrible, implicit bias is bad, certainly students have legal re recourse. Well, this is where our personal responsibility comes in because the law, you know, as I understand it in multiple contexts um, internationally as well, we're only responsible for following our policies. And our policies don't say that we're going to be discriminatory, right? But we're responsible to follow our policy. So even if we were wrong, even if that professor realized that they made a mistake, as long as we followed our policies when that student was found responsible, then we're not responsible for that discrimination. And that's, that's pretty sad. Research on bias also indicates that outside of those sanctions that, that professors are less likely to respond if they see um, a student's name from another race and they were using pretty much ethnic, um, ethnically diverse sounding names uh, for the study in 2013. Um, and then in another legal uh, report, they're showing the racially uh, disparate impacts of how university staff and administrators view students who are responding to complaints who are uh, minoritized. So this is very real and regardless of whether or not we're currently conducting, uh, co collecting that data, um, it does exist, it is pervasive, um, and it is very harmful. I just give a couple of examples here of microaggressions and academic integrity. Um, and here's what is said and here's how it may come across. Does that mean you can't say something like, did you not cover this material in high school? It doesn't mean that. What it means is that we have to be really careful about how things are received. And, and I, I think it's very important to think about the fact that what we, what we say has to be received by the other person. So it doesn't always matter what you meant. It matters what was received. Um, and we should, we should definitely be mindful of those things. And then the last uh, big piece of this uh, before I want to make room for some questions and then check on time is that idea of stereotype threat. Um, now you can see the chart here. We start with those stereotypes that are feeding into in, the in, implicit bias and you're seeing that everybody gets it. Everybody gets a piece of that negativity. And what it's going to do is either going to put in, it's going to put increased stress on a student and the student responds in kind. The student either, um, decides that they don't want to perform or they're going to try their best to perform and they struggle um, because of the weight of the, the sadness and anxiety. So I'll pause here um, and take some questions or comments. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Cecilia. I know Sarah's having a few technical problems. So, um, Sarah, are you back yet? All right, so I'll continue on with just asking a question that's come up in the chat. I'm just asking about whether there are um, some implicit bias trainings in any hearing panel or council trainings, um, or if there are any initiatives that do attempt to really educate stakeholders about how to incorporate um, equity into academic integrity. Are there any steps that are being taken towards that? So I think that that is something that is very much developing. 
Um, in terms of really good examples, uh, Sarah actually has come up with a beautiful statement around uh, equity in academic integrity um, that I do want to include in my, my resource materials, but it does a couple of things. It names the idea of this implicit bias. It names the um, historical marginalization of certain populations and that we have a responsibility um, to help help navigate students through this process in a way that's equitable and fair. And I think that statements like that um, are starting to pop up. I'm only I'm only familiar, you know, with the one in Canada and the United States, we have not uh, created our own, although I'm trying to work on that uh, with colleagues. But I think the biggest thing is that we, we have to be able to name that it's an issue. Um, one of the hard parts about it is that we have to name that there, there's that, that expectation of naming that there's a problem and a lot of folks aren't willing to do that right now, specifically because they aren't even willing to collect the data. Um, implicit bias training, I think is something that for as many of your staff, um, you know, your faculty, your academic integrity boards as a part of those trainings, that is definitely a best practice. When I think about student conduct in general, um, when I used to manage um, sexual assault and misconduct boards, that was a different training than our, our traditional university boards because we recognized that there were so many pieces that were unique to the experience of the individuals who were going through that process. And so it took very specific training um, that, that spoke to those pieces. I, I think academic integrity is no different, although we don't always uh, make the, the distinction that we need to bring in experts, that we need to look at bias and acknowledge it um, in that way. But very good question. I wish that there were um, more examples at specific institutions. I think that statement is is a great start and so I'd encourage you to, to look at that closely as well. Thank you so much, Cecilia. It's been so exciting to hear you speak today. I'm um, noticing that some folks are having to sign off soon and we're getting close to 1130 here. Just want to reassure everyone that a recording will be available of this afterwards and we will send that out by email to all participants. Just wanted to um, give you perhaps a, a, few, um, a few moments here to share any final thoughts that you might have, Cecilia, before we close off today's webinar. Absolutely. So I, I'm just so thankful for the opportunity. I do want to, I'm just going to go really quickly, if, if you bear with me. Um, I do want to give you some of those actionable items. Um, the first thing is that students need to be introduced before the need arises um, in mul with multiple measures. So in the classroom, outside of the classroom, in the context of the workplace. Um, you need to, we need to consider how we're looking at our policies and procedures. Who are we favoring? Are there students who can benefit from the system um, who are receiving economic and social benefits? Um, and if there is a difference there, um, how do we make sure that we can make that more equitable? Are we operationalizing our policies? Are we paying attention to language and cultural differences? And who are we engaging? Uh, we should definitely be engaging our students, our faculty, the institution needs to be fully engaged. Um, I've talked about this at length, but our, our data collection is really important and how the data is analyzed, who can view our information, is it public, and are we choosing to disaggregate, and if not, why not? Um, thinking about our institutional investments, how are we justifying our partnerships, particularly with e-proctoring, um, and how are we justifying that we're looking at algorithms that don't take into account our diverse student body? Um, how much autonomy do instructors have in, in creating findings based on algorithms and who's a part of that decision making process? Um, I talk about the implicit bias and, and stereotype threat and making sure that institutions are using uh, resources on campus or contracting with others who can help to provide that training for your stakeholders and boards. Um, and how are students involved in promoting academic integrity? How are we celebrating the things that they bring to the table? And how are we making sure that those students are represented in our syllabi um, and in our research as well? Um, and that just uh, brings me to the end, which is really focused on that student 
centered learning perspective, uh, which includes scaffolding our content, making sure that we're checking for our understanding, diversifying our syllabi, uh, diversifying our assessments, receiving feedback, um, making sure that we're able to implement that in the work that we do. Um, and that was a, a quick wrap up. I do have some other pieces in there, but I did want to be mindful of our time. And I'm so thankful for, for you spending time with me today. Um, please feel free to, to get in contact uh, to continue the conversation. I've, I've got my contact information here. Um, but I'm, I'm just so thankful for, for the opportunity to chat with you today. Thank you so much for joining us today. It has been a wonderful presentation. I got um, Zoom booted me out partway through, but I was able to sign back in and hear your last few slides. So thank you very much to Helen for stepping in to moderate. Um, and I just wanted to thank you again. I feel like this really could have been a three hour webinar. We've got a tremendous richness in the chat. Um, and there's also been lots of questions. And when you get back on Twitter, you'll probably see there's been quite a few tweets appreciating the content that you've shared. So on behalf of the Taylor Institute, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and you've important you've opened up some important discussions and dialogues that I hope all of us will continue to share and thank you to the participants who've joined in by the way from all over the world you've had people chiming in today from Canada the USA the UK Finland uh, it's been just tremendous so thank you again and uh, to those of you in Canada happy Thanksgiving thank you all and happy Thanksgiving it's been such a pleasure